welcome to season 8 episode 36 of the Ubuntu podcast. We're still at our camp in Liverpool and we're recording in a dining room table and in this episode we're going to be discussing camp. We're also <laughs> going to go over your feedback. I'm Laura and joining me this week are of course Alan. Hello. Martin. Hola. And Mark. Hello. So what have we all been up to since last time? Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. Like when, it's weird when you can see each other, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I don't think, like it. You'd think it would be easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have been playing with KD Connect. Well, I've not been playing with it. I've been using KD. Connect. What is, is it? That? KD Connect is um, a tool which you can install on your yeah. Linux desktop, laptop, whatever, and on your Android phone, and it connects your phone to your computer which allows you to do things like have your notifications from your phone pop up as notifications on your desktop. It allows you to send files both ways. It allows you to have a synced clipboard between your phone and your desktop, Ooh. which is magic. That's like proper convergence almost. Mm. Um, Show your face. <laughs> uh, so it's, uh, as it's the name... <laughs> As the name suggests, it's a, it's a KDE, uh, KDE app, but there's also um, an app indicator which uh, which implements an interface to it on non-KDE desktops. So I can run it on um, like Ubuntu or yes. Mate or whatever? Yes, you can. Huh. Yes. Now, the only, the only drawback with the indicator at the moment is that there's been a slight API uh, bump in KDE Connect and the indicator's slightly behind. So there's a couple of features that don't work reliably in the indicator, but yeah. they're aware and I, I see that that's going to be yeah. um, revised. Cool. But it's like push bullet, but open source without going through a third party service. Nice. Yeah. So you can connect. I think I, I've done it with my phone connected to the same Wi Fi as my laptop. It's not connected directly to the laptop. Um, I think you can also do it over Bluetooth if you've got decent Bluetooth support, which we do now in 1510. Excellent. Awesome. So, speaking of convergence, Alan. <laughs> uh, yeah, we uh, we had uh, the convergency stuff land in the Nexus 4 images uh, last week, and uh, it uh, it now functions. You plug it into a desktop and uh, a display, and you know, can use it like a desktop computer. So I've been playing with that a lot over the last few days. Oh, I just go, Ooh. out. <laughs> well, also, yeah. The, yeah, that, and also <laughs> discovering the peculiarities of it, and uh, yeah. you know, it's not finished. So it's like the first iteration of it landing on the phone. So next over the air update, uh, which is scheduled for November eighteenth, it will go out to anyone wow. using it on a Nexus Four. So if, if you have oh. a Nexus Four running Ubuntu on the stable channel, and you plug a phone into a display, it will it will do it. Just the Nexus Four. Only the Nexus 4 and Nexus 7 are capable of doing uh, video out over the right, USB over the port. The, the other phones aren't wired up to do it, right. unfortunately. It's and a bit of a shame. You say the Nexus 7 is capable. Yep. Does it, it works? Yes. All right, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, wasn't, I wasn't being like careful with yeah. my words there. Yeah. It was just, yeah, those two can, the others those, can't. Yeah, they've yeah. got the capability. Yeah. And anyone in the UK who might want to try this, uh, Argos are selling Nexus 7s. Uh, for about £100 at the moment, end of line stock. So if you want to grab one quickly, <laughs> oh, really? then uh, now's the time to do it. The Nexus 7 is quite good because it's you know, tablet sized, so has a nice, decent resolution screen mm. compared to the Nexus 4. It's quite good. And that's what you've been demoing at our camp? Yep. Yeah. Cool. And Martin? Uh, I have been preparing Odd Camp Talks. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, we all presented Old Camp Talks. We this did. Year. We were good Old Camp citizens, weren't yes. we? We were. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we should talk more about Old Camp. That's a good idea. Let's do that. So yeah, let's talk about Old Camp. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we all came to uh, Old Camp in Liverpool. Um, myself, Laura, Mark, and Martin all staying in a uh, luxury Airbnb house. Uh, and it's that's pretty good, actually. It is yeah. it's brilliant. It's a great way of doing yeah. it. I wouldn't, yes. I wouldn't say luxury. I think you're over it. <laughs> we're, we're in a house. Right. Yes. Good. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's in Liverpool, and the sponsors for the event were. Entroware, who were there with their computers and Steambox and Steam Link, uh, not Steam Link, Steam Controller. Yeah. Some of the stuff we've um, reviewed before on the show. Yeah. Hardware. Some stuff, some stuff we haven't. Yeah. Uh, Ubuntu, uh, 
supported by Canonical. <laughs> and Fedora were also sponsors, so we had a table opposite each other. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> you were Nerf gunning each other? Uh, no, we didn't Nerf gun. We did swap badges and pens <laughs> as peace offerings. You uh, play a game of football in no man's land. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Linux voice guys were here. Yeah. And uh, obviously the Open Labs people who, who ran the event. Uh, or gave us the venue, venue. Yeah. For, the, for the event. Yeah. It really is an amazing venue there. Just it because it's a university, you just have everything set up that you need for people to give talks and good spaces for people to mill around in. And, and it's a super modern building, so it's not like your kind of old 60s uh, university building where you sort of pork you like an old school or something. Yeah. It's just a really nice open glass, airy. Working Wi Fi. Yeah, yes. You know. Edge your arm all the way. Yeah. So, what was the what was the highlights for for you? Um, I I did some some interviews, which we'll have in a later show. Uh, I did an inter- interview with Entroware about oh, wow. their the hardware which they're uh, bringing out now and their Steam Box. Nice. Uh, I also spoke to a bit a bit about what what what's involved in making a Steam Box. Uh-huh. Um, and I did an interview with Ragworm, who've been exhibiting um, at. Bob Camp for several years now who make PCBs bespoke for hobbyists and other people about what they do. They make all the Pimarinis. Yeah. The yeah. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I really enjoyed that and just talking to all the people who were exhibiting was great. Um, I saw some good talks as well. What did everyone else think of the talks? Yes, there were some excellent talks. Yep. Uh, I particularly enjoyed uh, Ben Nuttall's GPI Zero talk. Yeah, that, that was, was today, Sunday. That was yeah, really yes, good. that was last Sunday or whatever. <laughs> 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 we'll yeah. On, the, on yeah. the Sunday of all yes. camp. Yes, um, that was really interesting because I didn't really realise that to use the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi at the moment, you currently have to, so for some things like if you want to um, dim an LED, you have to understand some ele- uh, some electronics yeah. concepts yes. um, and you know there's quite a lot of setup to do to get GPIO pins working um, which one, one of the things that Ben said is when you're trying to teach kids who are just learning to program how to do this it's really hard to say you don't worry about those lines there you don't need to understand them you just need to do them every time whereas um, this GPIO zero library extract uh, abstracts all of that away so right. you just have an object called button and you say which pin it's on and then you say button dot when pressed this other right. function yeah. which is brilliant yeah. like just just the apis that he showed us it's all just super simple and super obvious what you're doing and why you're doing you it you can focus on the logic that you want to implement yeah. not how you how you do program it, it. Yeah. yes yeah. did you see anything you liked alan yeah i uh, one of the stands was uh, some uh, radio amateur guys, uh, oh, yeah. radio hams. There was one guy sat there with his headphones on and turning dials, and there were these giant antennas out in the car. Oh, oh is that what they yeah, were? Yeah, those bipolar yeah, yeah. antennas. They weren't yeah. trying to catch flying. Like, <laughs> no, I didn't know if they were like always there. I didn't no, know no, they, they were put they, off specially. Yeah, I, I somehow managed to spot them. But uh, yeah, there, so one of the guys uh, showed me how you can use um, a USB stick, uh, like a DVB yes. television USB yes. stick, yeah. connected to a tiny little antenna on a baking tray and pick up the transponder data from aeroplanes that are flying wow. overhead. that's the ADSB data. Yeah, and he had um, a piece of software, free software, he was running it on Windows, but I think there's Linux versions as well, that takes that data and plots it on a map, yeah. so you see little pictures of planes, <laughs> and then it, uh, or like icons of planes yes, and which like way they're flying. City. Yeah, and on the side which there's the flight, the, the flight data, and then like a photo of the plane, <laughs> not as it's in the air, but you know past historical photos of that plane. It was just quite interesting, and that, and we only saw like a few planes because the building we were in was like quite metallic, and, yeah, and so you didn't get very good reception. But he said that a lot of people like run this kind of stuff and collect yeah. this data and mm. like, aggregate it, and so you can see where all the planes are at mm. any point in time. Some some of the organisations that do that flight tracking, flight following apps, they will actually send you equipment to set up and do this and join their network to improve the coverage of their flight tracking, flight following apps. So, nice. and in particular, if you're in an unusual part of the world where they don't have coverage. They'll send you, you know, the equipment to do oh, this. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's really, yeah, it's really, I was fascinated that it was just so, <laughs> he said that the antenna that he made mm. to get it working was basically 
two 10 centimeter bits of bare wire that he attached to the BNC connector on the yeah. antenna on this USB stick. And that was enough to get flight data. Wow. It's, it's super easy. And, yeah. uh, I think, uh, I think I'm going to be investigating that because I've got a little draw with a couple of these DVB sticks. Yeah. Some were supported, some aren't, but it was, yeah. uh, it was fascinating just to watch the planes on the map, you know, flying overhead. Mm. Do you want to call what about you, Laura? Pardon? What about <laughs> you, Laura? Uh, I didn't actually see that many um, talks. I somehow managed to miss them because I kept standing chatting to people. <laughs> yeah, that's also uh, one of the best things about Ockham, isn't yeah. it? It's meeting everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday afternoon, I spent, it seemed to spend the whole afternoon just standing in front of the yeah. board that had all the post-its on because I kept looking to say, see what I wanted to go to and then somebody I knew would turn up and we'd just stand there chatting mm, and I'd yeah. miss the next talk. So. Yeah, I mean, I was saying to someone... Uh, like uh, Chang somebody who said that they had been to a camp in the past where they just not seen any talks they just chat to people yeah. and yeah. I said well you know an event where you can do that not see any of the talks but still have a really good time that's really cool it's really good I spent yeah. all of the Saturday uh, on the Ubuntu stand so I didn't yeah. actually see any of the talks on Saturday um, one of the community members uh, Daniel Wood bought in a display and uh, we, we had it attached to his Nexus 4 and yeah. his little modified Nexus 4 docking station. He actually fitted a slim port inside the charging dock for his Nexus 4 right. to turn it into like a docking station for docking yeah. to a display. And it, it showed off, you know, what convergence is mm. really well. You know, people would come up and go, oh, is that running off of that phone? And as soon as you <laughs> see really good. the phone and the display next to each other with a Bluetooth mouse and keyboard, it's like, oh, I get it now. Yeah. I see. And... You know, it's it's unstable and it was, uh, you know, it's an early build. So, you know, we were like, don't uh, unplug the phone. Unsta- <laughs> but, unstable how? <laughs> because I had to go and I, did, I didn't break or fall over or anything. Uh, you didn't unplug the phone from the docking station. Uh, well, if you do that I and then to. plug it back in again, you know, what you would expect and in the future will happen is it will just seamlessly yeah. flip back and forth. Yeah. But that's not perfect yet. I used to own a VIC-20. I was taught from a very young age, never remove a cartridge from a computer when it's on. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I think we should mandate that. <laughs> so did, did anyone get to Stuart Language's podcast talk? Yes. He did, a, that that he did a really interesting it. talk. Um, so Stuart Language does a podcast called Bad Voltage, um, which uh, he is responsible for actually publishing the show once they've mixed it and got the compressed Og and MP3 files. Mm-hmm. Um, they publish it in several places, including on a WordPress blog and on YouTube. Um, and there's a few other things they do as well. Um, now, he doesn't like doing the same thing twice if he can get away with it. So his rule is that if he has to do it twice, he writes a script to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's been looking into the various APIs of the various things he wants to post the show to um, and has a script for his setup where he creates a, a text file which contains um, the show notes and puts that in a folder with the, the audio files and then runs the script and it connects to YouTube and it connects to WordPress and it connects to the discourse forum and it posts it to all of these places for him so he doesn't have to each time log into the websites keep youtube open while it re-encodes the file and so on that's really cool mm-hmm. so the reason that he was doing the talk was because he knew there are lots of other podcasters there like us right um who might benefit from doing things better and there are probably better ways of doing things than he's done them mm. so he wants people to to look at what he's done and perhaps yeah. try and build something more useful generally and and this was a a great example of an og camp talk because it was from a conversation on the friday night where he let slip i've got tools to do this and it was like well that should be a talk so not only did he turn up i think it was the first talk of the day or the the, the first talk i saw that day and not only had he got a presentation prepared loosely but like it said three hours ago it was committed to GitHub, so he stripped <laughs> out all of the access tokens and passwords and put it into GitHub. He has explained it's it it's it's largely hard coded for bad voltages purposes, yeah. but the principles are all there. So there was four or five podcasters at the end of yeah. that debating how we can work together to turn this into a general purpose tool that we can all benefit from. That's really cool. And the, the other thing that he was talking about where uh, Jono, Jono Bacon, who's also on Bad Voltage, wanted to put the podcast on YouTube. And Stuart wasn't really sure about that, but acquiesced and did it. And Bad, Bad Voltage uh, have 
uh, doubled their audience since they've started publishing their um, podcast on YouTube. So I think that got a lot of the podcasters thinking about where we should probably adopt YouTube as well. Yeah. Mm. There was also a, a few other interesting hardware hacky things. There was a uh, a guy who had um, some Nerf guns, yeah, and uh, it was a little contest where you shoot some targets, and it's all computerized. It has piezo sensors in the targets, and they're all connected via Arduinos to a system that would record your score. Mm. So you shoot these Nerf bullets at the at the things, and uh, it would. Uh, record your score and uh, assign uh, you assign it to you and tweet it to you when mm. when you got the score. And if someone else beat your score, it would let you know that someone's beat you, and you yes. have to come back and beat the score. <laughs> and so they were running a little contest over the, over the weekend of Camp to win some uh, some cool Nerf gun stuff. Yes. Um, it was re- it was a great idea because yeah. it was like, a great hack. Not Nerf guns like typically you know, people fire them at each other, but yeah. having a you know, some kind of electronic thing that can record your accuracy and, yeah. uh, and you know, and report online and stuff. Yeah. I thought it was really And the, cool. the winners of the, of, yeah. of the, there were three winners <laughs> yeah. um, who were um, three kids who had discovered an exploit in the system and taken advantage of it to score at something around half a billion points yeah. so, each. Whereas I, I, I think I scored 16,000. Yeah. On my first go, I scored minus 140. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I think I managed seven the first time I, I tried it. Yeah, that was a very Og Camp victory, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah, and it was like within 200 of each other, like yeah. half a billion. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else is in like the tens of thousands. Yeah. I'm wondering if that was some sort of integer overflow thing which well, they managed to find. I don't know, but I think it was great that uh, it, it was the kids that were mostly playing on that over the course of the weekend and it's the kids that won all the prizes and took yeah. all of the goodies home with them. <laughs> and yeah great uh, what else uh, did we see at Dog Camp there was a, a panel discussion uh, there was yourself Stuart Mark Stuart Langridge <laughs> Um, ben, ben Everard from Linux Voice and Peter Cannon Peter Cannon hosted and by Joe, Joe Rasmussen and it was quite a lengthy discussion about privacy well yeah the, 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 the premise of the panel was um, there's no such thing as the cloud it's just someone else's computer but that quickly evolved into a discussion about um, privacy of personal data what what people do with it why um, why people don't seem to be worried about um, using systems which are getting routinely compromised and their data mm-hmm. stolen um, and yeah um it's quite a, yeah, quite a lengthy debate. We got a lot of really good um, audience participation in it. Um, quite passionate audience yeah. participation as well, and lots yeah. of varied opinions as well, yeah. which yeah. was good. It wasn't yeah. just everybody shouting the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I think even though we we were a group of people that largely shared a viewpoint, I yeah. think it was quite balanced as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't just preaching to the choir. No, no. I thought it was interesting. I guess it didn't touch on other aspects that, that you might have thought of with cloud as like the usability of it or the convenience yeah. and all that sort of thing. That wasn't really touched upon why people do use the cloud and why yeah. and what clouds they use and things. It just became very focused on privacy, mm. which is presumably just mm. original thinking, but that wasn't what the, the statement was about. It was about cloud itself, wasn't mm. it? Um, I, going back to the Nerf gun thing, next to that was the funky little link art installation. I thought it was really that. cool. Uh, it was just all these little tiny white, like little tiny kites, maybe the size of a hand. Ooh, I didn't, um, oh, I didn't. Oh, no, I did see them, but I didn't pick yeah, up what that was. So if you blew on them, yeah, um, the lights flickered on. Oh, so the lights were responding, and it wasn't responding to movement. No, it was, it was a. Cleverer than that. It was a diode that had a wire wrapped around it that would heat the diode up. That was it. And oh, when you well, blow on it, it would it reduce the temperature. It. Oh, and when they reduced wow. the temperature, the lights would twinkle. Yes. That's that was amazing. really, really pretty. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I really like that. It was a commissioned piece of work that they'd done. Yeah. Um, but it was really nice. You could just like stand there and just blow it and all yeah. these little lights twinkle. And, yeah. And it yeah, was, was just cool. a little, I think it was an Arduino, tiny, tiny little tiny Arduino, Arduino with, a, think, yeah. with just a couple of extra components. That's really all it was. And a bunch of LEDs. And yeah. You've got quite an interesting uh, light installation. Cool. There was also, next to that, there was a 3D printed knitting machine 
That was, was 3D printed, was it? Well, components of it were 3D, oh, wow. 3D printed. Yeah. Oh, wow. but it, it, it was rotating round and making okay. kind of like a sock. Yeah. It was like, French knitting, wasn't it? Like you it? do on there. Oh yeah, yeah on a bobbin, bobbin with pins in it. Right. Yeah, but big. and it, it would it would just. I mean, all the technology was really just turning this yeah. thing around, and then it was weighted to pull it, pull it down, down while the wool was knitting. As the thing went round, it had little hooks that went up and hooked the the, the bit of wool Ooh. and pulled them down over the pins. It just oh, kept doing that yeah, as it that, went round. Yeah. It was really quite uh, mesmerising. It was. was. You could just yeah. sit and watch it for a very long yeah. time, and then every so often they have to stop it when there's a, a drop stitch yeah. partway around. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they have to stop it so it doesn't all tear apart, and then fix it with little hooks. But wow. it, it was quite interesting that that you know once they once they built this thing. He said, we're not actually sure what we're going to do. Creating massive socks. Sometimes it's not the destination, it's just the journey. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it was was excellent. It was really nice to see a a, a diverse set of projects. Like, you know, when you go from radio hams to, you know, PCB printed circuit boards to knitting and Nerf guns and lights and... Board games as well. Board oh yeah, games. there was someone yeah. there um, who's who uh, from a he has a, a company or project called Tangmu Games. So he um, does paper craft, like paper toys, but he also designs games. And so he did a presentation about a game which he describes as a cross between consequences and Pokemon, uh, <laughs> and also neither of which I played. So. And, and also also a board game he's made called um, Bar Bar Boom Sheep, where <laughs> you where you play as as um, uh, a tank trying to protect a meteorite from exploding sheep um, along with other people but you've also got to try and steal the meteorite at a certain point in the game sounds brilliant <laughs> yeah awesome so were there any other talks people went to um I went to uh, the talk on two factor authentication uh, where they presented the FIDO F2A which had seemed to be very, very, very well supported by uh, corporate organisations and banks, and some people were a little bit unsure about because of the sort of um, uh, organisations behind it. So I think this was another one where it, the idea had been sparked by a conversation the night before. So John yeah. Spriggs did it with another guy. I'm sorry, I don't know his name. So speaker one presented the f2a stuff and then john spriggs was presenting squirrel you know an open source equivalent Mm -hmm. that did the kind of same thing and uh yeah that was a good one so then this was looking into passwordless you know authentication and things like that Mm. cool i think that wraps up everything about hotcam yeah except the beer (laughs) we had a lot of fun And now it's time for your feedback. Chris emailed in. Your discussion about Ubuntu on phones led me to buy a device just for the fun of seeing the development of the system on a day-to-day basis. Install every OTA update and watch how new things emerge. I would like to buy a phone which will not be dumped and left to the community. The ideal thing would for me to buy a device which is mainly used by developers of the system. Is the Nexus 4 still in the hands of developers or have they moved on to something else? They're quite cheap these days and would fit my budget. I would be grateful for some assistance in my quest to buy the best possible Ubuntu phone for a long-term perspective. So, uh, as uh, an employee of Canonical, I should say, go and buy a BQ phone <laughs> because <laughs> uh, then the sales of BQ phones are reflected and, you know. Uh, but yeah, if you're a, if you're a, um, an enthusiast, then a good low cost way to get in is, uh, is the Nexus 4, especially as that, as we've already talked about, that's the one phone at the moment that yes. supports the external display. So that's mm. quite cool. Yeah. And yeah, you can get them quite cheap. And it, at this moment in time, is the primary target for that convergence stuff mm-hmm. because it's the only one that can do it. Yeah. In the future, that may change, and I can't predict what will happen in the future. Next year, there will be more devices that can do this, yeah. and I don't know how long we will keep on the Nexus 4. Yeah, that's once a those new, thing, isn't it's, it? It's hard to say. And what, what about the Nexus 7? What, what version of the Nexus 7 is, is supported? Only, in yeah, that's process? a good point. Only the 2013 Nexus 7. Okay. So that, that's actually another option is, is actually a tablet might be cheaper. I don't yeah. know. I don't know what the price of the Nexus 7s and 4s are. 
I, I bought a Nexus 4 at the beginning of this year, and I think it was about £90. Right. And I'm very sad that my wife broke the screen on it, because I'd still be using that for, um, you know, Ubuntu touch stuff. Right. Cool. Um, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. No, Laura usually does that name. It's Nadra Majstor. Nadra Majstor. Designed the t-shirt I am wearing. Oh, really? Yeah, right. Left a comment on the website. <laughs> Nadra Majstor left a comment on the website at ubuntupodcast.org. In Bash, one can use Alt plus dot to bring back the last option. Right, what? so in in a previous command line love, I think we spoke about um uh I think we spoke about something where you can you can type uh, a command and then you yes. can do something like bang at, which will then um substitute that for the the previous uh options of the last command. Yeah. Whereas this will if it's a if it's if effectively paste the options for the last command into the terminal, which means you can then edit. It does. Yes. I never knew that. I never knew this either. Cool. That's really handy. Yeah. So I, I just tested it. I just opened the terminal and did alt dot. Yeah. And it said puppy.com. <laughs> what? That's a bit weird. And it turns out the last command I did was ssh, puppy.com. Uh, so uh, yeah. It done that. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Good yeah. tip, Nadra Mashdor. Uh Adam... <laughs> Oh dear, I'm very sorry if I'm butchering this. Adam D. Dimitric seconded this comment. This also works with ZSH as well, and if hit repeatedly, will iterate the last arguments going back through the history. And a poppy goes to test it. <laughs> it does as well. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like it's like pressing up, but only for the arguments. But only for the arguments. All of the arguments, or just the last argument? I think it's all of the argument. All of the yeah, arguments. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, it's not. What? It's only the last. Oh, the last argument. Yeah. Oh, Because okay. I'm going, I'm scrolling up and I'm seeing stop and start, yeah. which would be service so thing, yeah. stop, okay. service thing, start. So it's only the very last thing. Okay. Which That's is, interesting. Yeah. Well, this sounds like a wheeze. What, what other li- little key bindings are there in Bash and yeah. SSH that we yeah. don't know? Tell us, tell us more of these. Tell us more yeah. of these. These are good. Yeah. I yeah. like these. Nico emailed us on show at Ubuntu podcast.org. I was downloading the new Ubuntu Mate ISO and noticed that the download location was a bit strange. Some wacky url.cloudfront.net. I'm always a little bit paranoid, so since I thought I was downloading from cdimage.ubuntu.com, I googled cloudfront.net to find out what it is. Well, that only made things more confusing, since many of the sites were how to remove Cloudfront pop up virus, etc. So, what is going on and what is this cloudfront.net? And is it okay, I assume, since Ubuntu is using it, why are people talking about some virus of the same name? Sorry about the stupid question. I'm a bit confused about this and wanted to ask someone about it. Right. I know a little bit about this, but not very much. And I assume this is the download for 15.10. But when the release of 15.10 happened, there was about an hour where it all went wrong. Oh, right. <laughs> and people at Canonical were putting their pants on the outsides of their trousers and fixing stuff to do with the mirror network that hosts the ISOs. Right. And I think this is using CloudFront to orchestrate all of that mirror replication. So, so depending on when you actually tried to download the ISO, which you're quite correct, you come from cdimage.ubuntu.com, it was broken for a bit. And there was a message going out saying it's all fixed now. And I took them at their word and then noticed for Lubuntu and Ubuntu Mate, it wasn't actually fixed. And then somebody else did some more tweaking and it all worked again. So there was a small period where it was a bit weird, but it's it's something to do with the mirror mirror network is orchestrated and managed. Right. So during during the release, one of the steps that the release manager does is, is tell the IS department to push the images to these cloud providers so that Right. So that they're cached and we don't, you know, uh, kill our servers yes. with all the traffic that's coming on release day, which, you know, used to happen sometimes. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for that. Cool. And finally, Enrique from Southwest USA left a comment on our website. Love your show, though I didn't understand when you guys were talking about some sort of popper <laughs> that you can put in the microwave instead of frying. <laughs> As we say here in the States, we don't have that there food in this here place. <laughs> I should probably uh, probably elaborate on this a bit further. I was talking about poppadoms. Um, when, uh, at least in the UK, when you get a curry, an uh, Indian style curry, um, you tend to get a bag of poppadoms with it, which are these big sort of crispy bread things mm-hmm. 
No. Well, it's, it's, well what, what's it made of? It's made of chick, chickpeas chickpea or, flour. or um, maize. Yeah, it's basically yeah. a flatbread which is fried and goes really crispy and you dip it in mango chutney and other nice sauces <laughs> as a sort of uh, accompaniment to your curry. Um, now, the way that these are normally made is they're made in, like they're nice and flat and then you pop them in a frying pan full of hot oil and they go all bubbly and pop, puff up and then you let them dry out and they go all crisp. Um, and I, my discovery was that if you put them in the microwave, they also pop up and go bubbly and crisp, but without all of the oil and having to wait for it to dry. Mm. I, I, I was surprised that, that, you know, that, I don't know, maybe it was a sarcastic comment, but surprised that there was like, you know, probably they haven't had poppadoms over there or maybe we just like didn't pronounce it well. Very <laughs> clear. It wasn't, it wasn't very clear. <laughs> yeah. I think that's all of the feedback. We love getting your feedback, so please send it to us. Even the pointlessly mean stuff makes us laugh. If it's short, tweet us on at Ubuntu Podcast. If it's less short, but please no essays, email us on show at ubuntupodcast.org. If you'd like to discuss some of the things we talk about with other listeners, post on our shiny new subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash Ubuntu Podcast. Or you can just leave a comment on the relevant show notes on our website, ubuntupodcast.org. And that's all for episode 36 and our recording at Hog Camp in person. Yes. Um, audio, audio processing will be back to normal next time. <laughs> that's all in our little bunkers. Yes. Um, so we'll be back next week when we'll have more news, comment and discussion. Mm, thank you all for listening. Yeah. If you came to Hog Camp too, I hope you enjoyed it. Mm. And probably t- spoke to you, so lovely to meet you. Yes, <laughs> it was actually. It was nice having people come and say, no, I, I listen to Ubuntu podcast. You know, yeah. Or... I had a few people come by the stand and were asking me questions about Ubuntu and then said, oh, I know your voice. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, that's me. So, yeah, see you next time. Bye. 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 And stop recording.